Michelle, if you're going to be the greatest of all time, you have to be the greatest of all time for everyone. You can't just be the greatest of all time for the ladies on The View or the CCP or politically correct people in the Democrat Party or the media. And I think Brady knows that. I think Tiger Woods knows it. Jordan knows it. Tiger knows because, it, yeah. you, you know, and, and let me just add something else. And he's not the greatest of all time yet, but guys like Aaron Judge, when Aaron Judge puts on that captain uniform, like Jeter before him. Like and he Jeter, goes into, exactly. Right. And he goes into Yankee Stadium. He's there to be an entertainer and an athlete, and he's there for everyone yeah. who put their butts in the seats, not That's just correct. the mixed race mixed race people or the Democrats or the straight people or the get he's there he's there for everyone. And this is something that I think some athletes miss. Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya Podcast. So A.J. Rice wrote a best-selling book called The Woking Dead, How Society's Vogue Virus Destroys Our Culture. And now he is following it up with the White Privilege album. <laughs> he's, he's irreverent, he's funny, he's clever, and he writes some great essays. And we're excited to take you through this book. But we're going to talk about sports, too. Uh, so if you're curious about that. It is, this is a fun conversation. But A.J. Rice is also the president and CEO of Publius PR. Um, he's editor-in-chief of the Publius National Post. And as I said, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, The Woking Dead, How Society's Vogue Virus Destroys Our Culture. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And this follow-up book is really, really fun. And I'm telling you, it could be a great holiday gift. Uh, it's it's terrific. So stay tuned. AJ Rice and I are going to go through that. Plus, we're going to talk about one of the most iconic plays in Super Bowl history. AJ Rice, welcome. I got to tell you, I, I <laughs> right out of the gate, the title of your book just brought a smile to my face. The White Privilege Album. A little bit of a nod there to the Beatles' White Album, bringing racial harmony to very fine people on both sides. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, Listen, I, I, don't don't tell Yoko. All right, I, I want to apologize. I, I want to apologize to the Beatles. Right, maybe not to Yoko. I think Yoko's <laughs> probably wandering the streets of Manhattan right now, uh, muttering to herself. But uh, oh, poor Yoko. Look, you, yeah, I know, I know. Poor Yoko. I blame it all on her, though. Uh, well, look, you it, have to have if you're going to tackle. Wokeism and political correctness, you got to have some fun doing it. And that's what I'm doing uh, with the book there. And big shout out to the very fine people. I know they're in this audience. So big shout out to them. <laughs> well, they're, yeah, I think there are some on both sides. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point. We've been missing humor so much and we need it. And this, to tackle quote unquote wokeism, I know that woke originally ha was the term like you're awake to all the prejudice, you're awake to the oppression, you're awake to your, you know, your victimized role in the world. And it, it, it has now come to be broadened to mean many things. If you were to define wokeism, how would you, how would you? Well, I've tried to put together a unified theory of wokeness. Uh, it's hard to do because it's a target rich environment. And, you know, this, this book, The White Privilege Album, is actually a sequel to my first book from two years ago, which was called The Woking Dead. So, I mean, I noticed when I was doing that, I'm like, man, you could rewrite with the craziness in the culture. You could rewrite this every day. I mean, it is just it's like the Crayola 64 box of, of nuttiness. Uh, I mean, you you dealt with some of it in a you know, broadcast career and in sports. I mean, it it doesn't just creep into the political media. It creeps into everything. So, yeah, right. Exactly. And I, I tackle some of that. In both books, in the White Privilege album, I talk about Aaron Judge and I talk about Jim Brown. I talk about Mike, the real goat of basketball, um, you know, and, and Jackie Robinson in particular and Branch Rickey and some of the risks certain people have taken to, as the left likes to say, bend the arc of progress towards justice. Now, while we're doing that, if we can use humor to bend the arc of progress away from wokeness, I think yeah. we can be both entertained and enlightened at the same time. Um, so, I mean, look, that's what I try to do with the book. And, you know, speaking of sports, I, I have to say this, Michelle, my family will throw me in the Delaware River if I don't get, uh, get this question off 
to you. And I know this is rare, okay. but wow. Okay. Uh, so, so I am a Irish Catholic Philadelphia Eagles fan. And Bless I rarely heart. get, right. I get, I get to ask someone that was present for the greatest play in Super Bowl history, or maybe you'll tell me it was something else, maybe the Steelers. But I have to say, what was it like to be present during the Philly special, the trick play that had Belichick uh, slipping on banana peels? You were there. I've got to yeah. know. And this, my all the broadcasters in Philly are going to – Stagall and, and all the boys there, they're all going to ask me, did you ask her what was it like? So tell me, what was it like on the sideline as a broadcaster? People are referring to the Super Bowl that was played in Minnesota at U.S. Bank Stadium between the Eagles and the Patriots. And uh, Nick Folk was the quarterback for the Eagles. And who could have imagined that with him as quarterback? I mean, this guy's I don't think he's going in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he's a backup. We've got a statue. (laughs) Philly, Philly. That's right. He, you know, there's a timeout. He goes to the sideline. No, no one can see this coming, right? You just, you know, they're driving and uh, and they're playing arguably against the greatest defensive mind, you know, in Bill Belichick's defense. And suddenly this play evolves and you sort of can't believe your eyes That's because right. Nick's running for the end zone and he's this big gang, you know, he's athletic, obviously, but he's this big gangly guy running into the end zone. And you're going, what in the hell is going on? He is wide. Oh my gosh. No one's he's going to catch this football. Can he keep his hands on it? Oh, he did. It was crazy. And you know, the, 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 the funny thing about it is the Patriots tried something similar, trying to throw a pass to Tom Brady. It didn't work. That's right. So uh, it was, it was a fascinating Corey, Corey Clement, Corey Clement to Troy Burton to Nick Falls. Yeah. The quarterback catches a touchdown pass. And I think, that was third and goal when they called I, that. I think it was third and goal. So, I think you're so, right. So, I mean, look, there's a statue of him outside the uh, link. Uh, you were there. Uh, you, look, you were an amazing uh, sideline broadcaster for all for the years at NBC. Thank you. You know, the Philadelphia fans obviously didn't like the boys up in the booth. They like Al Michaels, but obviously Collinsworth, you know, you know, He's, every he everyone gives him some Collinsworth jazz. a hard time. Everyone thinks Collinsworth is biased against their team. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm sure the Patriots fans thought he was biased. And I'm sure the Eagles Probably. fans thought he was biased. But, but Michelle, was, if you would have told me that I was going to wake up that day and that Brady was going to throw for four or five hundred yards and lose, I know forty-one to thirty-three, one I of know. the craziest games ever. You were there, and bravo to you. No, oh, um, it was a big was a shout blast. out to the. To, you know, go birds, and uh, you never know if the Eagles don't go, if the Eagles don't turn it around a little bit this season. Belichick might be wearing midnight green by the end of it. You oh never my know. Gosh, can you even imagine? Well, everyone's saying, you know, t- send him to Dallas. Send him to everyone. Everyone wants know. him. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay, back to the white privilege album. Sure. Because uh, I'm sure there are people who think that Nick Foles has um, white privilege and, and that he got to catch that ball because. You know, <laughs> Well, I mean, he's he's a little less white than Carson Wentz, who was a redhead, so you know, <laughs> you know who got himself injured, uh, uh, never recovered. So, so, so yeah. yeah so, let me just let me point out to the audience because one of the entertaining things about this book is it's rather than chapters, you've got track listings one through twelve. The twelve, that's right. the twelve months of privilege, and rather right. than the twelve months of Christmas or the twelve days of Christmas, January privilege, February tr- privilege, March privilege, on and on and on. And it, how did you come to that? idea. Sure. So, I mean, I call it an album, but if you, you know, an album can be a collection of essays, a collection of songs, a collection of pictures, and there's 82 essays in the book. And what I did was I organized them through 12 chapters, an entire calendar year where I go month from month, chapter one's January, chapter 12's December, and I go through American traditions, American holidays, historical moments that happened at certain time periods, and, you know, yes, I sort of write the way I talk. I'm a little bit of a wise ass, but I also try to bring some sort of uplifting stories to show different people, some, some of them in sports, some of them in politics, that risked, you know, blood, reputation, and treasure um, to try to make the country better and to try to, you know, sort of right wrongs of history, whether it's Branch Rickey and the Dodgers or Abraham Lincoln Morgan Freeman. I mean, I go through a lot of different types of people. Um, so, yes, obviously I'm trolling some people with bringing racial harmony. But I will tell you, um, I think it's working. 
And, and, and although, you know, if you look at our politics right now in particular, and this is not what the Democrats had in mind about a bringing racial harmony, but if you look at the coalition that is kind of sick of hearing about the patriarchy and white privilege and, you know, this 72 genders and all the different things that are out there, the, the coalition behind Donald Trump is the most multi-ethnic sort of yeah. coalition I've ever seen. They can't, they're having a hard time pegging them as just being the red hat wearing, you know, bros, yes. you know, yeah. white bros. Because if you I saw a poll yesterday, Michelle, that Arab, Arab Americans now in a majority are backing Donald Trump. Jewish voters in Pennsylvania, uh, he's ahead with them. So if anyone can end the, 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 the Arab Israeli crisis right yeah. here with different, different talk about bringing racial harmony. Trump's yeah, doing it. Thing. And look, there's something fun for everyone in the book when you read it. There, there really is. It's, um, I, I, you, you go through this Jim Brown, MAGA's legendary running back says goodbye. That's one of the, the essays in May privilege. Uh, some of the sports for you. Let's talk about Michael Jordan. Well, you know, I love the folks at besthotgrill.com because they have this product that is going to make the best holiday gift for the griller in your life. Here we are. It's October. The weather has been exceptionally good, but grilling is still a thing, right? Because you're still maybe going to football tailgates. You're going to Friday night lights, college football games, whatever you're doing. Solaire tailgate infrared grills should be right there with you. They set up fast. They heat up quickly. It takes only three minutes to get to searing hot temperatures, just like the big backyard Solaires. This is just a small one. A Solaire grill will make you the master of the tailgater with the juiciest, most flavorful food in the parking lot. But like I said, you can take this thing anywhere. With the fast grilling times, you have more time to enjoy all the other festivities going on around you. And they also cool down fast, so you're not going to miss any of the game. These are USA-made, Solaire, anywhere, everywhere, and all about infrared grills. They are portable. They're perfect for anyone on the go. I'm talking picnics, camping, RVs, boating, but especially tailgating. Amaze your tailgating friends with the great food you grill with your Solaire infrared grill. Learn more about these fantastic grills at Solaire's Try Before You Buy demo rental program besthotgrill.com besthotgrill.com that's besthotgrill.com uh some of the sports for you let's talk about michael jordan everyone loves michael jordan so how did you sure. highlight him in the book so jordan and i wrote about kobe actually because he died when i was doing my first book it was you know like with jim brown it was kind of an obituary to kobe yeah. I called no. Kobe the last unwoke NBA superstar. And if you were to go a little bit uh, you know, ahead of him and was his mentor, and they were very good friends, Michael Jordan kind of um, you know, embodied what it is to be the greatest of all time. Because mm-hmm. as you mentioned Brady earlier, Michelle, if you're going to be the greatest of all time, you have to be the greatest of all time for everyone. You right. can't just be the greatest of all time for the ladies on The View – or the CCP, or politically correct people in the Democrat Party or the media. And I think Brady knows that. I think Tiger Woods knows it. Jordan knows it. Tiger knows Because, it, yeah. you, you know, and, and let me just add something else. And he's not the greatest of all time yet, but guys like Aaron Judge, when Aaron Judge puts on that captain uniform, like Jeter before him. Like Jeter, goes into, exactly. Right. And he goes into Yankee Stadium He's there to be an entertainer and an athlete, and he's there for everyone yeah. who put their butts in the seats, not That's just correct. the mixed race, mixed race people or the Democrats or the straight people or the get. He's there. He's there for everyone. And this is mm-hmm. something that I think some athletes miss. And look, I'm a professional publicist by day. I work with a lot of egos. OK, a lot. You know, I write these books for fun, but usually I'm promoting everyone else's book. Right. And I can tell you. You know, LeBron and KD and some of these NBA guys in particular, they're definitely being handled badly by these publicists because, look, I, here's what I say. If you go to any gymnasium in America and you, you fill it full of fifth and sixth graders and you tell them all, everyone wearing Jordan sneakers to stand up, men, women, 
people from all over the place, it looks like the United Nations, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and there's nothing more unifying than that. That Jordan was here to teach all children, regardless of socioeconomic bracket or skin color, to fly, right? To fly. Whereas LeBron, you know, you go to the same gymnasium, you might have some blue haired, you know, substitute trans teacher in the back wearing LeBron sneakers. No, I'm joking. But, 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 but my point is kind of. he doesn't, he doesn't seem to understand that, that, right. that you're, that, that you're, you have a responsibility and it's not to just point out every grievance in American history yeah. or say, I'm not going to go to the white house uh, if we win a championship because Trump's the president, mm -hmm. which is what they did. Right. Steph Curry it's, did that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's so interesting. And I think, I think there is always blowback for some of these, you know, Steve Kerr spoke at the Democrat national convention. Uh, you know, we've had athletes come out and endorse candidates that sure. you know, I understand and I appreciate their willingness to take a stand and to take the risk of that blowback. I do think, you know, I'm a big free speech advocate. I I'm almost, I'm an absolutist basically. And I, and I, so I, I support their willingness their, to do that. But I do think that sports was the great unifier and still can be the great unifier. But when you That's kneel right. during the anthem, there will be blowback because That's there right. are so many people out there who are going, what are you doing, Megan Rapino? I wanted right. to like you. And now I see your true colors, you know, this right. sort of anti-Americanism. And, and so, yeah, it's it's really, really interesting. What, what do you... <sighs> You know, I saw Bradley Whitford, for, star of West Wing, the other day. At a, did you did you see his rant? I mean, he's he's around every four years, you know, with the grievance and the ranting about. You and know, he was going I mean, off it started on with white, George W. Bush. Yeah, yeah, he was going off on white Christian nationalism, which to me, <laughs> I, I that term, how did how did that evolve? How do you know where that came from? Well, I think, I mean, they've always yelled about white supremacy and they've right. always, Republicans have always been the Klan and Hitler, even though Hitler was in charge of the National Socialist Party in Germany and the Klan was invented as the sort of paramilitary unit of the Democrat Party in the, you know, the South during Reconstruction. I mean, they, <laughs> the left wing ideas gave birth to both of those organizations, but right. for some reason, you know, Republicans probably starting with Nixon, probably, and then Reagan and the Bushes and Trump. They, I mean, even they've even called Romney and McCain Hitler. So oh, I saw I saw Hannity put up some graphics last night about that. I'd forgotten. You know, even even moderates are Hitler. Uh, my, they're moderate Hitlers, Michelle. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. I, I always wonder, though, if Trump's going to be Hitler in his second term, did he did, did he did he, you know, Forget to be Hitler in his first term? Why, why, why wasn't he Hitler? I mean, he's already been president. Is he going to now, is he like a caterpillar turning into a Hitler butterfly? And then now he's going to be more dangerous than ever? Um, they, look, they don't like Western civilization. So that allows them, and when you hear white privilege, that's code. It's code for a couple things. Uh, Western civilization is, you know, a construct of the patriarchy and white white supremacy and so on. That's why you saw the ladies on The View trashing the Queen of England when she died, right? But if you if you actually examine Western civilization, which is Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian civilization, we have provided more peace and prosperity and medicine and charity, uh, ending world wars, ending cold wars, um, than anyone in history. Uh, but for, for various philosophical reasons, they have been after it for a long time. So when you hear the, the white Christian nationalism, I think in the front of their mind, they're talking about the very fine people, because if you've examined this election season, and I had no idea this was going to happen, I only made this part of my subtitle to kind of troll, to troll the Democrats in the media. But the very fine people on both sides hoax, because that's what it is, and it's been yes. debunked. It's been debunked by Bill Maher, Michael Rappaport. CBS News, Snopes, which is this uh, Soros-funded fact check organization, that hoax that is basically the foundational sort of lie for Trump yeah. is a racist. For and that yep. and that and Biden said that was the reason he ran. That's and then it, exactly. the very fine people they made an appearance at both debates. Kamala brought it up. Biden brought it up. So I think when you're hearing celebrities talk about that now, they're still repeating this that Trump called white supremacists very fine people, right? 
So, I mean, and, if, and look, I'm not, I, I live in Northern Virginia. I'm not that far from Charlottesville. There were actually four groups on the ground that day. And the mayor gave, gave permits to, for protests to some of the crazy ones. Uh, you did have people that were there to stir stuff up, uh, you know, white nationalist types. And you had, <clears throat> you know, Black Lives Matter there and Antifa. But you also had the Virginia Historical Society that were trying to figure out a way to get that the, the statue of Robert E. Lee and his horse, Traveler, moved to the Civil War Museum of Virginia, like they did right. the Stonewall Jackson Memorial. I mean, this this is something that played out after and around George Floyd. And I told people at the time, Michelle, I said, look, when they're done with the Confederate generals, they're going to come for the Union generals, <laughs> okay? And they did. They There's came no, for, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they came for Grant and Sherman and Lincoln and everybody else. So, because it's not really about that. It's about, no. it's about resetting our culture, which is why yeah. a couple of weeks ago we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day, right? Instead so, of Columbus Day, that's uh, right. although some, some very good, uh, very fine people uh, stood up for Columbus and celebrated it anyway. Indeed. But you're right. I mean, this, I, I, it tends, it feels to me, and I think this is why Israel is so hated too. You know, America Absolutely. in the West has been out there on the edge, the cutting edge of advancement, of moving society forward, of development, of, of prosperity. And if, right. if you're kind of against, you know, if you just hate all rich people, then in general, you hate the West. Because you think that, you know, success is not a good thing. Like it's, right. they're more successful than we are. I think, you know, Israel has been incredibly, an incredibly innovative country, much like America has, oh. sitting there in its little island, you know, uh, uh, surrounded by countries that want to destroy it. And exactly. it's still done that. And they, they hate that. And I'm, I don't know what like psychologically makes people hate success or progress or commerce or capitalism or money but it is bitter what what do you think sure. what do you think is at the core of so that hatred? with israel i mean israel is the canary in the mine shaft for western civilization i mean israel yeah. is you know the forward operating base and they are surrounded by enemies trump brokered a bunch of peace treaties with the yes. arab countries around israel the abraham uh, he, he moved he moved the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But, you know, uh, the thing is this. You are, you are absolutely right. Um, there is slavery on planet Earth going on right now, but it's not right. going on in the West. Right. Right? So they always, they always talk about the last slavery, never the first one, which was Moses uh, by the Egyptian pharaohs. Right? So, so the, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm Irish. I mean, I'm not complaining about the potato famine every day. Uh, you, you know, even though I could, I guess you should, you know, there should be reparations for the Irish. Uh, well, you know, look, there's one thing about humanity is that, you know, in most of its iterations, it kind of is terrible. I mean, we're, we're, you know, that's why when you talk about civilizations, not all civilizations are created equal. And the one we have, we have to preserve. And mm -hmm. that's not to say we can't be the melting pot, right? You, you look, we're not a multicultural country. We have one culture, Western culture, but we are multi-ethnic. And if you come here legally, you can come to the West and participate in the nuclear family and the middle class and Western civilization and everything that, that blooms from our hemisphere. You can do it. And look, we've even, it's even been exported to other places. I mean, one could say Japan, Israel, they're not exactly in the Western hemisphere, but they have taken some of the, our techniques, our innovation, and they've made their own countries bloom. South Korea has done the same thing. I mean, it, it is a great thing. I mean, we can all it, sort of lift, lift each other, right? Yes. I, I, when I did the Tokyo Olympics, the COVID Olympics, it, I was so sad for the world that they did not get to come into Tokyo and see Japan at this pinnacle right. of, of beauty success, innovation. I mean, they were so ready f to just show off this incredible city. I was so, so impressed with everything in and around Tokyo. And it broke my heart that the streets were empty and people couldn't see what they had managed to do. Um, I would not have gone to the Beijing Olympics. I, you know, the Winter Olympics that sure. were in Beijing, I just say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, be sure. Because the slavery you talk about 
and and genocide still being committed in in China is enough to make you uh, sick. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the increasing cost of health insurance? Oh, I mean, have you had enough of not having control over your health care dollars? Well, introducing ShareRight, health care done the right way. At ShareRight, you're not just a number. You're part of a caring community. And forget about paying excessive premiums. With ShareRight, you stand to save 30 to 50% compared to health insurance. Think about what you could do. 30 to 50%, all that saving? Uh, Wow. But it's more than just savings. ShareRight ensures you have access to the care you deserve and precisely when you need it. From routine checkups to unexpected emergencies with ShareRight, your health care is their top priority. So empower yourself today by taking control of your health care costs. Visit ShareRight.org slash Tafoya, T-A-F-O-Y-A, to learn more and see how much you can save. Visit ShareRight.org slash Tafoya. So it's S-H-A-R-E-R-I-G-H-T dot org slash Tafoya for healthcare done the right way. It is amazing to me that we just keep harping on our past. We don't, I don't know why we don't celebrate our progress more and look to the future with with anticipation and optimism. Sure. Well, look, a lot of times totalitarians of a feather will will join forces. I mean, Hitler, the most re- racist regime in history, joined forces with an Asian country, with, which if you read Mein Kampf, would have would have had to go too because they weren't white, you know, right? But right. if you look at if you look at the the Bin Laden's guys before 9/11, I mean, here they are in a cave in Afghanistan, and they're thinking with the 7th century mentality, but they've got 21st century technology and weapons. So, you know, when when I saw Black Lives Matter throw its support behind Hamas, uh-huh. I thought to myself, wow, that's interesting. You know, the, the, the intifada, the cultural intifada, which, you know, is, is pushed by wokeness and every other type of totalitarianism, the trans mafia, the Me Too movement, all of these different things, They can sort of work together, which is why you've got people jumping on stage and attacking Dave Chappelle for jokes. You've got people going to Brett Kavanaugh's neighborhood, right, looking for him. you got people breaking Rand Paul's ribs. you got people shooting Congressman Steve Scalise. You had 30 years later, and this is by no means a man of of the right, but Salman Rushdie wrote a book kind of critiquing Islam, critiquing Muhammad. It was called The Satanic Verses. It, you know, in the late 80s, and here's this guy carrying out a fatwa on behalf of Iran 35, 40 years later almost, yeah. stabbing him, almost killing him. So so there are free speech absolutists. Some of them are on the left. I think Bill Maher gets it right most of the time when he's not talking about Trump. But Ricky Gervais standing in front of the Golden Globes, yes. just dunking on them, dunking on them, Right. So, so there is hope out there. There are yeah. people that, that, are, that don't make this about Democrats and Republicans or skin color. It really is about, are you going to try to control me, control my speech, control my movement, tell me what to put in my body? That, yeah. And I think that's what we have to push back on. And I grew up listening to Limbaugh, and he used to say his job was to use irreverent humor to illustrate truth. That's the fun I'm trying to have with my books. Yeah. It's, you know, I had the pleasure I, of, of dining with Rush Limbaugh twice. He was a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan. So oh, yeah. one of the times it was Al Michaels, Chris Collinsworth, Rush Limbaugh, and me. We had a great conversation at that time. This was probably, oh boy, 10, 12 years ago. And I, I Chris and I told Rush, um, we got to take the abortion issue and just let it go. We, got, we can't, I know there's a, a big chunk of pro-lifers out there, but- it's losing us elections time and time again. And, and, and Rush really listened to us. Uh, the second time we had dinner was more in a, it's a much bigger group situation. I applauded Rush for just stepping into this Sunday night football dinner and uh, just being himself. He Very, very sweet man. I want to finish with this, though, AJ. We're sitting here. It's October. We're almost at, you know what? Let's go to November because November is a pivotal month, as you and I both know. And November privilege. Here are 
Here are the chapters in November Privilege, just to tease our listeners. One, Joe Biden's Crayola Army. Yogi Bear's darkest secret has been exposed. I miss my Aunt Jemima and my Uncle Ben. America's Idi Amin, the last king of Clyburn. Meet the patron saint of fentanyl. Fentanyl, however you want to say it. The era of pretendians. And for Thanksgiving, the pilgrims say, you're welcome. Uh, Let's see, which one do I want to focus on? Joe Biden's Crayola Army. Give us a taste of what that chapter, what that essay is about. Well, I mean, we talk about how sports gets invaded with wokeness. You know, it was it was really only a matter of time. And Obama kind of set this up that the Pentagon and, you know, our military would be less concerned with, you know, breaking stuff and killing our enemies and more concerned with having our army look like a, ben- a Benetton ad, <laughs> right? Yes, a, su- yeah. a sushi menu of diversity, right? right? I'm not sure that would have worked. I'm not sure Grant defeats Lee with a sushi menu of diversity, although Grant had escaped black slaves in his army fighting against the South, and they still want to take down statues of Grant, and they still deface Grant's tomb in in New York City. So, and, and look, Patton, MacArthur, Pershing in World War I, I mean, we, it should, be, the military should be about merit and accomplishment, just like sports, right? Just like most things should be about that. You know, Kamala Harris has never won a primary by herself. Say what you want about Hillary Clinton. She took on Obama in a primary and lost. She took on, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders in a primary and, you know, he almost got her. And then she took on Trump. Um, so, so that's the thing is that, with the left, they always want to sort of – they want equal you know, outcomes instead of equal yeah. opportunity. Right. So that's what I'm doing there. I mean, the, you know, gender reassignment surgeries, they're worried about that. I mean, I'm more worried about ISIS and China, right, yeah. than I am about yeah. uh, Michelle and I paying for, you know, gender reassignment surgeries from the Pentagon. Not high on my list. I got to be honest with you. Not not high on my list of of cares in this world, and 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 that's why I do as a as a woman, and I I am I am more pro choice. Uh, but I get really ticked at women who make that their soul that abortion is their t- top issue. It's like, sure. d- wait a minute. Do you feel safe? Do you have enough police officers in your community? Do you see right. Trende Aragua coming in and maybe feeling threatened by that? Do you see sure. what's going on around the world, how it's on fire? Do you, you know, what about anti-Semitism? Are you okay with that? Abortion, abortion. It's like, oh right. my gosh. I mean, some um, of what you're, some of, some of the excesses of Kamala Harris making her campaign uh, solely about abortion up until this point, combined with the excesses of the, maybe the Me Too movement, I think have made a lot of men feel like they don't matter. It, that yes. they're that they're unnecessary at best. So mm-hmm. if you see this sort of gender gap in the voting uh, public, it's because of that. It's like, okay, well, what you know, you know, third and fourth wave feminism, you know, have have made men feel unnecessary yes. at best, and maybe predators at worst, right? Mm-hmm. Like I I wrote a section in the Woking Dead called "How I Did Not Meet Your Mother." which was about, you know, parody on the show, How I Met Your Mother. Right. And the reality is, and Michelle, you know this, a lot of people meet their spouses or their significant others either during their commute, you know, I'm standing in line and there's this girl at Starbucks, you know, I'm, today I'm going to talk to her or in the elevator or at work or maybe at church or at a youth group, maybe in the classroom if you're in law school or high school, whatever it is. And I think Gen Z was told that to take it down a notch, Toxic masculinity, right, is trickling in and that, you know, you might not want to ask Michelle to the dance because you might be a predator or say that she looks nice today. It's 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 making males feel inauthentic. And that that just didn't happen because, you know, men lift weights or they listen to Joe Rogan. Right. So so they, they've got some ground to cover there because men do feel alienated and it's not just white guys. Black men, Hispanic men yes. feel that way too. So I, we have had a whole coalition of black men on this appear on this podcast, telling me exactly that and why they are voting for for the former president rather than the vice president. And and yeah, they feel that they've been talked down to quite a bit, uh, and they 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 feel like they need to push back. So 
I, I am so stoked about your book. Do people say stoked anymore? I just did. I think but, so. um, I, I'm, a, know, I'm a geriatric, I'm a geriatric millennial. So I, you know, <laughs> I, I still say stoked. Uh, I, I, and I love this. You're, you're one of your, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the blurbs. Well, no, it's your, when you de your dedications for my grandparents oh, who sure, had the yeah. privilege that's of right. saving planet earth from not the Nazis in the 20th century. And you named yeah. them. And I just love that. And yeah, uh, I had to do it for all the for talk, you. for all the talk of Nazis just growing on trees, like in apples in an apple orchard, you know, there actually were devastatingly evil regimes. Yes. So I, I'm always like when, when the Nazis show up and I hear people saying it, I feel like we've won the argument, Michelle, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. No kidding. Once they no once kidding. they show up, I think that they've run out of things to do or say. The White Privilege album, bringing racial harmony to very fine people on both sides by A.J. Rice. What a pleasure it's been. These are courageous books. I always tell, tell my audience at the end of each show, be brave and do good. And I think you've done those things in both of your books. Uh, the White Privilege album. Go get it. Uh, great Christmas gift. Great Hanukkah gift. Great right. gift for whatever holiday all you very fine people on both sides That's celebrate. Right. AJ, dreaming, thanks for being here. We are we're dreaming of a white privilege Christmas, right? We never know what's going to happen. But look, Michelle, you're a patriot. Uh, you know, I appreciate your body of work over the years. And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't end with just saying, go birds. <laughs> and with that, thanks, AJ. Thank you.